Good morning and namaskar. Welcome to the Indian podcast on Bharat Varsha and its stories. Hindu Society Under Siege by Sita Ram Goyal. Chapter 1. Significance of Hindu Society. Hindu society is the only significant society in the world today which presents a continuity of cultural existence and functioning since time immemorial. Most of the societies known to human history, east or west, north or south, have suffered a sudden interruption and undergone a traumatic transformation due to the invasion and victory of later day ideologies such as Christianity, Islam or communism. The pre-Christian, pre-Islamic and pre-communist cultural creations of these societies are now only to be met in the libraries and museums thanks to the labors of antiquarian scholars. Hindu culture can meet the same frightful fate if there were no Hindu society to sustain it. This is the point which not always remembered even by those who take pride in Hindu culture. There are many Hindus who cherish the great spiritual traditions of Hinduism and its scriptures like Gita and the Upanishads in which that tradition is enshrined but they do not cherish with an equal enthusiasm the Hindu society which has honored and preserved these traditions and scriptures down the ages. Again there are many Hindus who proclaim that their great confidence that Sanatan Dharma that is Hinduism can never die. This is true in a sense. There will always be individuals in non-Hindu societies who will recover the mystique of Sanatan Dharma through their efforts at self-discovery. But Sanatan Dharma will surely suffer an eclipse and no more inform mankind at large with its message if there is no Hindu society to sustain it. Lastly there are many Hindus who are legitimately proud of an Hindu art architecture sculpture music painting dance drama literature linguistics lexicography and so on but they seldom take into account the fact that they that this great wealth of artistic literary and scientific heritage will die if Hindu society which created it is no more than to preserve it protect it and perpetuate it but the death of the hindu society is no longer an eventuality which does not or cannot be envisaged this great society is now besieged by some dark and deadly forces which have overwhelmed and obliterated many ancient societies suffering from a loss in its elan it has become a house of divided within itself and its beneficiaries no more seem to be interested in its survival because they have fallen victims to hostile propaganda they have never developed towards it an attitude of utter indifference if not downright contempt let no hindu worth his soul to remain complacent hindu society is in mortal danger as never before it would be relevant to recall the history of hindu society in order to put the record straight for there is very little in that record which invites indifference or contempt and a good deal which deserves honor and homage a word about misunderstanding first at one time the dominant school of western historians and their indian disciples from whom hindu society commenced with alexander's invasion presented this history as a series of successful foreign invasions to which hindu india invariably succumbed the even invented an aryan invasion of india in the second millennia bc to round up their cherished image of this country as some sort of a free for all which any adventurer could descend and dwell at will the aligarh school of historians have come out with the thesis that hindu society been basically an oppressive and exploitative society since its very inception the invaders did not have to mount much of an effort in order to break whatever resistance it could muster at any time the minority of oppressors we are told retired from fortified towns and citadels and majority of oppressed masses came out in support of the invaders who were hailed as liberators the marxist historian in their turn have welcomed this aligarh approach with open arms 
their materialistic interpretation of history stands vindicated. They have extended the alleged thesis to mean that invaders were not only liberators of the social and political plane, but also great incentives to force of production. These foreign invasions, we are informed, were thus so many steps out of economic stagnation and towards material and social progress. It is little use crossing swords with the stalwarts inspired by Makkah and Moscow. It has been seen again and again that whatever be the facts, their conclusions remain the same. Their conclusions remain the same because their motives are the same. Their motives are to malign and misinterpret Hindu history in order to denigrate and destroy Hindu society. Now many Indians too have joined the game. Responsible Western historians have ever conceded that Hindu history is very much older than the Alexander's invasion. They also concede that the theory of the Aryan invasion in India is at best a conjure for which there is no positive evidence, literary or archaeological. They admit further that the account which the Hindu gave of themselves in the face of foreign invaders have been quite creditable and by no means dishonorable. And they agree that whenever the Hindus suffered a defeat, it was largely due to their own neglect of and consequent inferiority in the art of warfare rather than any serious defect or deficiency in their social system or cultural milieu. There was a time not very long ago when Hindu culture was a revered culture throughout the civilized world. If seers and sage, if mystics and more, its scholars and scientists, its missionaries and merchants took its message to the farthest corners of the world, East Africa, Egypt and Utopia, Sumeria, Assyria, Babylonia, Cathalia and Iran, Burma, China, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, Indochina, Indonesia, Malaysia and Thailand, Pacific Islands, West Indies, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, Asia Minor, Central Asia, Greece and Rome. The history of hundred cultures and nations provided evidence of this hoary heritage in, this, in their religious and philosophies, languages and literature, sciences and technologies, manners and mores. True, the Hindus never constructed a strong centralized state like that of the ancient Iran and Rome, which could tyr tyrannize over its constituent unit and invade the neighboring countries. Yet their society was a strong, steadfast and stupendous creation based on the highly decentralized yet a cohesive social fabric made of organic two units such as the clan, kula, caste, jati, village, grama, town, nigam, metropolis, nagar, country, janapada and empire, samrajya. Imperials, imperial systems rose and fell. But the infrastructure survived the test of time and remained vigorous and vibrant till the recent times. Greek historians who accompanied and followed Alexander tell us that before this adventurer led his short-lived raid against the Republic of Punjab and Sindh, only two other foreign invaders had had the courage to cast covetous eyes to India. Queen Semiriaris of Babylonia in the 8th century and Cyrus the Great of Iran in the 6th century BC attacked India with the vast armies but were defeated at the borders and made to flee with very few survivors. Plutarch leaves us with no doubt that Alexander himself had it to beat a hasty retreat from the banks of River Bees which baffled by the brave resistance from the series of small republics their armies refused to cross. And this successor in East, Seleucus Nectator, or Seleucus Nectator, was soon humbled and not only made to cede conquered Indian territory but also pay homage to Indian Emperor by matrimonial alliance. But the wheel of time turns. The Hindus lost some of their vigor and vitality and vigilance. They neglected the art of warfare which was acquiring new dimensions in the neighboring lands. The Scythians, the Kushanas and the Hunas who stormed in after the degeneration or the deintegration of Mauryan and Gupta empires did succeed in conquering and ruling over the large parts of northern and western India. 
The spell of foreign rule, however, was rather short-lived. All these invaders were not only defeated by the rising tide of Hindu heroism, but also absorbed and integrated into the vast complex Hindu society and culture. This triumphal course of Hindu history suffered a severe setback only with the advent of the Muslim invaders in the middle of the 7th century AD. The Hindus were now faced with an adversary who was not only qualitatively superior in the art of warfare but also armed with an ideology which was altogether alien and uncompromisingly inimical to the basic premises of the Hindu West norm. The war which the Hindus had to wage against the new adversary was ceaseless and long drawn out. The armies of the Arab Caliphate, which had humbled the Persian and the Byzantine empires, which had conquered the vast territory stretching from the Hindu Kush to the Atlantic Ocean, and which had converted to Islam vast population en masse, could not only advance beyond Sindh in spite of repeated invasions. The Ghaznavids, the Ghauris, the Khiljis, the Tughlaqs, the Mughals who followed fared better and succeeded in establishing imperial dynasty which ruled over large parts of India for several centuries. But Hindu resistance did not cease for a day. The Rajputs, the Vijayanagar Empire, the Marathas, the Bundelas, the Jats, the Sikhs rose to the fierce revolt one after another till the fabric of Muslim rule was destroyed and dispersed by the middle of 18th century and number of cowards which Islam considered its political power and intentions could win during its long spell of seven centuries was rather small. This victory of Hindus over the Islamic hordes could not only be consolidated due to intervention of British invader who wielded not only an unprecedented superiority in the art of warfare but also a much subtler weapon of diplomacy. The Hindus were enslaved once again. The British also brought with them the form of Christianity and ideology which too was altogether alien and intensely inimical to the trends or the basic tenets of Hindu way of life. Fortunately for Hindus, Christianity in the West, including Britain, was soon overwhelmed by the riding tide of humanism, rationalism and universalism inspired by the revival of Greek heritage. Christianity, therefore, could not obtain an unbridled sway in the councils of the British rulers as Islam was able to do in the courts of the Muslim kings. It was only under an earlier invader from the West, the Portuguese, that Christianity was able to harass Hindus for some time and in some areas. The struggle against the British invaders was also not a long drawn out as against the Muslim marauders. The rise of liberal democracy in Britain was a great help to the Hindu freedom fighters. Nonetheless, the battle had to be fought on many fronts, revolutionary and constitutional, violent and non-violent. It is a point of some pride for Hindus that their struggle for freedom inspired similar struggles in many other countries of Asia and Africa, and that the dawn of Indian independence in 1947 heralded an era of independence for many of an enslaved nations. A society which has survived invaders, who devastated and ultimately destroyed so many ancient societies, should now be rightly regarded as the wonder of the world's history. The foreign invasion of India have been brought into bolder relief by the very fact that Hindu society defeated and dispersed all of them in the final round. Only that the society can boast of freedom from foreign invasions which had lost its identity, body and soul into that of the conqueror. Such a society leaves no successor who retains a racial or cultural memory and who can spread out in national homage a role of honour for its heroes. With all its weakness, Hindu society has never been such an imbecile society. In the normal course, the Hindus have had such a glorious history should have come into their own after 1947 and resumed their career anew of cultural creations. But balance sheets of this saga and struggle and sacrifice for freedom have not turned out to be favourable to the Hindus. They have lost to an alienated section of their own race some of the hallowed lands which were at a time of the very cradle of Hindu culture and civilization. 
and they are no longer honored citizens even in their own homeland. A permanent stigma seems to have stuck the term Hindu and Hinduism. These have now become a terms of abuse in the mouth of very elite which Hindu millions have raised to the pinnacle of power and prestige with their blood, sweat and tears. How did this happen? I have come to the conclusion that the Muslims and the British invasions of India, though defeated and dispersed, yet managed to crystallize certain residues, psychological and intellectual, which a battered Hindu society is finding it difficult to digest. I emphasize and repeat, I have come to the conclusion that the Muslim and British invasions of India, though defeated and dispersed, have yet managed to crystallize certain residues, psychological and intellectual, which a battered Hindu society is finding it difficult to digest. These residues are now in active alliance with powerful international forces and are being aided and abetted on a scale which an impoverished Hindu society cannot match. And lastly, although a loggerheads amongst themselves, these residues have forged a united front which is holding Hindu society under siege. The danger is as much from within as from without. What are these residues of foreign invasions which are holding Hindu society under siege? The Muslim invasion of India crystallized one residue which we shall all name as Islamism. The British invasion, on the other hand, gave us two residues which we have named Christianism and McCallism. We shall analyze their roles in India and their alliances with international forces one by one before we present a picture of the United Fund which we have forged to fight the Hindus, which they have forged to fight the Hindus all long along. This was the end of the first chapter. Please stay tuned.